Hey, namaste, everybody. Lisa Irma here, the Breakthrough Life Coach. And today I wanted to talk about letting go and the absolute power that we can find in letting go. Um, and I wanted to talk about a um, this idea of letting go and what we can do to check ourselves in codependent recovery. And one of the most powerful things that we can do, I just want to turn my phone, my phone's off. One of the most powerful things that we can do is that when we are stuck thinking that other people should do what we think they should do, then that is a clue. We are stuck. And that is a clue that our brain is associating pain with something outside of ourselves that we can't control. And that is when we will suffer. All right. I just want to say hello to William and Savannah. Um, so if you're on this channel and you have um, been attracted to my work, then chances are you a have you're a wounded adult child. You possibly suffered some type of childhood trauma in your life, and you know a little bit about codependency, and you may have attracted narcissists into your life, um, and you are a truth seeker. You don't want to be stuck anymore, right? I did a live stream today in my membership site. I have an I have a monthly membership site, and I did a live stream today, and. Um, I thought that what came up was very profound. I just want to say thank you to all you guys. Um, Kylie just said, oh, I am so codependent. Um, and hey, Lisa, your work has helped me so much. I'm so happy. And JC, appreciate you so much. I appreciate you guys. You show up, right? You show up. If you are working this work and you are doing what you can to check yourself, you are a warrior. Um, you are somebody who's like, I know this happened to me, but I need to know what I can do about it, right? Because I can tell you, dear ones, that humility is a big, it is so important in recovery because of so many reasons. This is a multi-dimensional universe. You are not just physical, you are vibrational, right? Everything is about patterns, right? And so you have to understand that like is attracting like. So if I keep attracting, hello, Alice, if I keep attracting dysfunctional people, then I have to understand I'm co-creating that experience. And by because all human beings are unconscious, right, I will not know that that is what's going on. So we are subconscious as well as conscious. We are physical as well as non-physical, right? We are um, 3D as well as 5D, you know, <laughs> like... We are these multifaceted human beings. It is so cool. What you are is so cool, right? You are your past, but you are your present. And dear one, you are your future, which you are helping to create and you have control over creating. And I just think that is so exciting. And that's what my message is all about. Um, so let me see. Um, Carrie just said, can't believe I'm getting you twice live in one day because she's a member of the group. Um, so... But anyway, just I don't want to get distracted by by the chats. If you guys have a question, I'm going to be live until about four o'clock my time, time maybe four or five. Um, but I wanted to share this message with anybody that wanted to listen to it. You have to understand that you are a multi-dimensional human being. You are subconscious as well as conscious, and you are more unconscious than you are conscious. Not good news if you are an abused adult child. That's just not good news. If you were born to parents who were enlightened, even one parent, if you had one person in your life that said, you matter, come to me, talk to me, how do you feel, right? So many of us have parents who make our lives about them. They, they think they're helping us, but they're telling us what to do, or they're discouraging us from doing that. You know, and it, if they don't even realize it's about them, it's not about us right? We needed somebody in our life to make us feel like our reality was real and it was valid and it was good. 
And we needed someone to say, go after it. Is that if that's what's on your heart? Follow through, follow through, follow through. So because we're 95% unconscious, if we have been raised by dysfunctional people, the problem with that is that we are unaware as to why we're doing what we're doing today. Unaware. Now, the only way to heal our lives is to become super, 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 super aware of what happened in the past so that we can make connections in the now so we can affect our, our present. So Karen just said, how do we cope with people who keep feeding off of us? I try to get clear of people, but this keeps showing up. So Karen, great live stream for you because what we have to accept, dear one, like it or not, is that we are co-creating our realities, right? Not our fault. That's, it happens to everybody. That's just the nature of humanity and what it means to be a physical human being. We are unconscious, we are subconscious, we are subject to what happened in the past. You know, whoever raised us, we attune our vibrations to. So if they're dysfunctional, unfortunately, we've attuned ourselves to this dysfunction. We could, we could think we're doing everything right, but what we're gonna attract is dysfunction. So how do we stop attracting dysfunction? We have to become super aware. We have to accept that we're part of the co-creative experience. And that's really hard to do because whenever I encounter, and I've got people like this in my own family, dear ones, that's why I think I know so much about this topic. But whenever I encounter somebody who is still ongoing, ongoing with their struggle, you know, um, what I try to figure out is what are they not letting go of? And what are they trying to control that they really can't control? Who are they trying to control? What are they trying to control that they ultimately cannot control? If you associate pleasure in your brain with trying to control people you can't control, you will suffer. Suffer. So if you think that you can control your daughter and your sister and your coworker and your boss, if you unconsciously believe that you have to control these people in order to breathe easy and to love yourself, you're going to suffer. That is the human condition. That is what is associated to unconsciousness, living below the veil. It is so, so, so powerful to be born asleep, right? Dear ones, all babies are born asleep. They're born into a dream state. That's why they wake up and they go, well, they wake up and they go back to sleep. Like they're up for 30 seconds and they're sleeping again because their brain waves are in a dream state. That's why they sleep so much. Children are in a theta brainwave state up until about seven. Okay. Do you know what that means? That means if your family life was frigged up, right? If you had people tell you that you're bad, that you're stupid, you have a learning disability, um, that you, there's something wrong with you. If you got the feeling that your sister was better than you, or she was more worthy of you, if you were sexually abused, if you were physically abused, right? If you were taught by teachers in school, if the teachers in school treated you differently, all of this becomes downloaded information like a computer. And your subconscious mind does not argue with you. The subconscious mind only says, okay, okay, I'm bad. Okay, I don't know why, but I get sexually abused. I don't know why, but people don't like me. I don't know why, but I get bullied. I don't know why. I don't know why, right? Because the subconscious mind in a hypnotic brainwave state is just accepting this information. So it's really, really important that if you're here, you understand that your job is to awaken. Your job is to peek your head above the veil. Your job is to be able to say, what happened to me in my past? Pin the tail on the donkey, right? It's very, very important that you understand that what happened to you in the past happened, it was not your fault, and now you've got some programs running that you need to learn how to, and this is the hard part, you need to learn how to override those programs. Now, what we have to accept is that we dip in and out of states of unconsciousness all the time. So I don't want you to think that, ooh, I'm conscious, right? And that's it. You have to understand that a state of consciousness dips and it comes up 
and it dips and it comes up and it dips. So on any given day, right, in any given frame of time, it could be five minutes of time, we could be highly conscious, then drop into unconsciousness. That is the nature of the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. None of us are highly conscious all the time, but that is the goal. I said to um, JC just said, um, why I gravitate to narc narcotypes feel somewhat incomplete, yet I see I am willing to stay. Can we heal and compromise? You can't compromise and heal because healing is non-compromise, right? Um, so um, the goal is to no longer, the goal is to acknowledge my part in it. So what I wanted to do in this live stream is really, really encourage people to understand that humility is a part of this process. We have to understand our part in the attraction process, right? So you are a human being, but you're also a magnet, right? You are an electronic tower of energy, okay? Your heart is beating because of electricity, okay? You, you grow, your nails grow, your hair grows because of the electrical currents that are running through your body, okay? That's just the reality. Um, your thoughts are energetic reality okay you give off an electromagnetic field about eight to ten feet out some you know spiritualists will call it an aura scientists i think call it the emf it's your electromagnetic field right so you know it would be so nice if like scientists and like people who are into spirituality could like have a conversation and just accept we're talking about the same freaking thing I say aura, you say EMF, but my aura is my EMF. My aura is my electromagnetic field. And scientists will acknowledge that we all have an electromagnetic field. If I am an electromagnetic field, that means that I'm giving off a certain frequency because every field of energy is giving off a particular frequency. So what does that mean, right? What does that mean? If you are energetic in nature, you are going to attract into your field that which is equal to you. Now, this is where, where things get a little fuzzy for people who have been wounded and who are codependent. We struggle with this idea because if I am a codependent, why am I attracting a narcissist? Because on the surface, it looks like we're opposites. But actually, no, because below the surface, both are severely wounded individuals, right? And both are seeking validation. Now, the way they go about getting that validation is very different. Um, and also the intention, the intention is different. A narcissist demands your attention and feels entitled to your attention, where a codependent does not feel entitled to your attention, but you're, you're, a codependent is always hoping that you will validate and doing what they can and twisting themselves into a freaking spiritual emotional, physical pretzel to try to get someone to see them, right? But at a quantum level, we have two very, very wounded human beings that feel invisible and are just trying to feel seen. But in the physical world, remember, we're both non-physical as well as physical, right? So, you know, on a non-physical level, their vibrations are very similar, okay? So it's important that we don't allow our psychology, right? Our psychology, which is a product of the environment, your id, your ego, your super ego, your inner critic psychology. You know what that's a product of? The outside world. Because although part of our personality and part of our psychology is definitely innate, our environments, what we hear and what we experience help shape the id, help shape the ego, help shape the super ego, the inner critic. And the narrative, that's where our narrative comes from. Our internal dialogue came from the external world, right? So we have to be careful that in our psychological mind, right, we're not judging people, we're discerning. Huge difference. I did a video about this, I don't know, two years ago. And since then, a lot of people are hopping on it, um, which is fine, which is fine. But, you know, I want you guys to understand the reason you choose to discern rather than judge is because it keeps you out of a lack vibration. So discerning what is before me so that I, I 
can figure out how I want to proceed. So it's very, very important that if you are on the healing path, you have to understand. Now, this is another thing. This healing stuff is, you can do it. But there are steps and there are strategies that you need to understand and incorporate, right? And I'm going to share some of those with you. Um, now, when you begin to, this is where we struggle a little bit when it comes to um, humility. So much of us, so much of our past is tied to shame. So much. And so when we start holding ourselves responsible and when we start being humble, what we come into contact with is shame. And that's where we need to hold on to self-awareness and higher thoughts, the divine feminine and the divine male energy that we really, really are. We have to know, like Maya Angelou says, basically, when I knew better, I did better. You know, Christ on the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, right? So we think about these wonderful teachers that we've all encountered in our life at one time or another. They're all saying the same thing. Is there really free will if you didn't know what you know now? In other words, would I have screamed and yelled and judged my own children when I was a young mom? Would I have done all these things had I understood that I was living below the veil? Of course not. Of course not. But when I was going through recovery and I was coming in contact with um, humility and knowing that I have to figure out how to hold myself responsible so that I can change what's wrong in my life and teach my children something else, fix whatever the hell is wrong in my head, fix my vibrations so that I can track something different and become the master of my reality. If I'm going to do that, I've got to figure out what the hell I'm doing wrong. I have to figure out what is my part in this? Because I understand how reality works, right? We're all actively, actively participating in this field. We are all co-creating our realities today and tomorrow. We all are. And it's really, really hard when you think about this idea. I'm living in a woman's shelter. I've got three kids, you know, and I, I've just left an abusive husband. I didn't create this. Not, no, you did not create it. And you didn't create it on purpose. And it's not your fault that you're there. It's so important, important that people understand that wherever they are, it's not their fault. If where you are the, is where you are because you didn't know that you were living below the veil and you didn't know that your abusive childhood made it difficult for you to break up with a narcissist and instead you stayed with a narcissist and you walked around on eggshells and you had his kid, right? And then you, you had to protect the kid and you're just in survival mode. And then you have another kid, you know, because you're afraid to say no to him to have sex, right? So now you've got two kids, right? And now he's drinking and you don't say anything because he might beat the shit out of you and he might hurt the kids. So you're in survival mode, right? It is not your fault if you are in that situation and no one taught you how to love yourself. No one taught you how to honor what was on your soul. No one taught you how to set boundaries. No one taught you that you were enough. It is not your so fault. If your whole life you were living in survival mode, and now as a grown-ass man or a woman, you've attracted this narcissist in your life who is a psychopath, who is, who is abusive sexually, physically, mentally, verbally, psychologically, financially, you name it, that is not your fault. It is not your fault. It's so important that you know that. Because you have to know that so that you can check yourself. So you can say, okay, I'm here. How did I get here? How did I get here? How did I get here? Let me check out my past. You know, wh what kind of person was my mom? You know, what kind of things were downloaded into my brain? You know, that made me doubt myself. You know, what was it about this narcissist's love bombing that hooked me? You know, some of us are so thirsty for love, that when a narcissist love bombs us, 
our brain floods with oxytocin and we, this love bonding chemical, our brain floods with serotonin, dopamine. And isn't it interesting that dopamine, the word dope is in dopamine, because you start to feel a little like dopey, meaning like you lose your ability, right, to like think because your brain is so flooded with these hormones and these chemicals that make you feel seen. Now, if you were a child that felt seen your whole life, and all of a sudden you bump into a narcissist, female or male, right? Female or male, you know? Um, and you started getting love bombed, you, as somebody who already felt love, loved, and, and John Bradshaw would say, you as somebody whose love tank was full, would look at this person and say, dude, you don't even know me. How could you love me? What do you mean you love me? You know, you would, you would actually be able to like be more objective. But what happens is when you're so starved for love and then a narcissist comes into your reality and they can smell you, they can sniff you out. They know exactly who's insecure. They know exactly who feels invisible and they target people like that because they're easily manipulated and they use the feelings of love, like feelings of love and intoxication to their advantage to hook you. And once they hook you, their role is really to be dominant over you. Their agenda is dominance, right? And so if you want to learn more about narcissists and how they behave, you know, research dominant behavior or dominant personalities and what their agenda is, right? And so if I'm controlling you, right? I feel powerful. I'm in control. I don't feel out of control, right? And so a narcissist needs to dominate and control others. And I think they're more codependent than a codependent because they cannot be alone. They need someone to control and to manipulate. That's, they absolutely need it. Like a codependent in recovery, you know, um, once they get it, they understand love addiction and codependency. You know, a codependent, even though it's hard, even though it's hard, a codependent will um, acknowledge, I got to be by myself. I got to be by myself, you know, um, but a narcissist, narcissist, um, no, they can't be by themselves. So um, it's important that you understand that healing requires humility, but the sticking point for so many of us is that we are so filled with shame. We don't think that we're good enough. We, we don't know why people can't love us. We don't know why we can't fit in. We don't know why people reject us. Everywhere we go, we face some type of rejection. We think that our friends are closer than we are with them. Um, we can't get along. We can't, we can't feel like we belong, right? And that is uh, really a byproduct of what we experienced in childhood. And when children don't feel bonded with, when they don't feel um, enfolded by their tribe, a child always assumes responsibility for that rejection. And I personally think it, I personally think um, that that is because if I assume responsibility for your rejection, tomorrow I might be able to control it. Tomorrow I might be pretty enough. Tomorrow I might be quiet enough. Tomorrow I might be good enough. Tomorrow, maybe you will feel better and you will love me. So this is the way a child thinks. And a child assumes responsibility for all the pain. And that is why we feel so much shame. Now, my big shtick is above the veil or below the veil. And it is an illusion to think that just because you're talking and you're breathing and you're walking that you're conscious. No, you only need to be about 5% conscious to carry on, carry on a halfway decent conversation, right? You don't have to be aware to have a conversation because your subconscious mind will just say to someone, how are you? Good, great, hope your family's good. How are you feeling? Great, awesome. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, I don't really have that many plans. Da, da, da. It is a, it's rehearsed over and over and over and over. And so it's important that you realize that just because, and this was a big shocker for me. It was a big shocker. I remember going, what? 
I can think about the way I think. It, it really, it freaked me out. I was like, oh my God, because up until about 35, 33, 34, 35, I thought that I was thinking, but I wasn't. I was reacting. I was reacting, dear ones. I was below the veil of consciousness. I had all of these predetermined thoughts in my head. My brain had downloaded information. The amygdala was very, very stimulated. My hippocampus, the hippocampus is the area of your brain that stores memory, right? And so I didn't realize that what was happening in the conscious field was really just a byproduct of what had been downloaded into my amygdala and my hippocampus. That's the way the conscious field works. The conscious field is like Bravo television, really. The conscious field is like a television set, right? And all it does in this field that you can observe with your mind's eye is all it does is flash information before the screen that's been downloaded into the subconscious mind. And what people do that are below the veil, right, is they're reacting to what's coming up on the screen. That's the average human being. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I'll say it again. So um, you have the subconscious mind. You have the amygdala and you have the hippocampus. The amygdala is where your, your um, well, your fears are stored. In other words, we all have a need for tactile stimulation. Um, we all have um, uh, a fear of loud sounds. We get, there's a startle reflex, right? Um, we all know that we are supposed to be nurtured and be loved. And we all know that, or put it this way, if we get what we need, we will psychologically, emotionally, spiritually evolve pretty damn well. If we don't get what we need, we get stuck. Right. And we get stuck trying to trying to get those processes met. So we get stuck trying to get our needs met. And that never leaves us until we get the needs met. You could be 80 years old. I've coached people in their 70s and 80s who are stuck. These poor things, they are stuck. It's not their fault. So it's important that you understand that you can be an animated human being and not be conscious. And when I say conscious, I mean the type of person who has self-awareness, the type of person who knows that I can observe the way I think, okay? Um, it's the type of person that is interested in observing the past and from a higher state of awareness, working through these programs that have been created in the past. Really, really cool stuff. So the conscious field, Imagine the conscious field is like a television screen and you are observing what's flashing before the television screen. So imagine you're watching a Giants game or a Jets game. I'm from New York, so I'm saying Giants, Jets, and Yankees, whatever, whatever your shtick is. Imagine that you're watching um, a sports game on television and you are, yeah, yeah, you're reacting, right? Okay. You're reacting to the program, right? You're reacting to the program. Most people walk through life reacting to the program. That's not consciousness. That's not consciousness. What I'm talking about to heal is you have to become aware of the program. Observe the program, not react to the program, not react to it. So imagine now you're sitting back in your living room and you're watching television and you're watching your um, programs flash by on a television screen. Now, instead of rah, 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 instead of that, you're observing them. You're observing them and you're saying, wow, that's why I do that. Wow, that's why I feel that way. Mm -hmm. Wow. And now what you've got to learn to do, and this is what I teach people how to do through my programs and videos and whatever, meditations. What I try to do is I try to help people become their own television programmer. I try to teach people to be observing of what's happening on the screen of your mind. I help people detach from what's happening. And I help people to discern what's happening from them and the past. Because you are not your past. Your past is an experience, right? A memory isn't bad, it's just an experience. 
but it's your attachment to the memory. It's your associations to the memory that are keeping you stuck. And that is why healing requires humility. And so if you take anything away from this live stream today, and I'll be doing more, um, but if you take anything away from this live stream today, I want you to think about this. Um, someone just said, Sylvia said, can observing create judgment? Only if you allow it. When you're observing, you're observing from a state of non-resistance. You're observing from a state of pure observer, right? When So imagine thinking about watching a sports game, right? So imagine you, you're watching two football teams um, and they're competing. And imagine you don't have any skin in the game. Meaning, imagine if you um, don't really care what team wins and you're just observing. Imagine if you're a scout, you're a coach, and you're sent to this team or this game to pick out the best players and to pick out the worst players and to figure out what players need help. There's no judgment there. There's just discerning. There's just observing. There's just categorizing, figuring out, right? So, oh, that that lineman tends to trip over his left foot. So if I help him do this, then he won't trip over his left foot and he'll be a better lineman. So that is what I teach people how to do. I teach people how to detach, observe their thoughts, and help them figure out what thoughts are getting in the way and what thoughts are tripping them up. And then we have to reprogram. We have to add new ideas, and then over and over and over and over and over and over and over, replay these new ideas so the old programs are begin to fade away, right? So know that if you really want to heal and free yourself of any situation um, from any situation that you're in, so let's say you're in a really, really bad situation and you want to get out of it, right? You have so much power, like Eckhart Tolle says, says, <clears throat> I love him, but he's so wordy, you know, big words. I have to go to the dictionary and the, the source to figure out what he's saying, but he's brilliant. I love him. I'd love to hang out with him. Um, <clears throat> but Eckhart Tolle says, or Tolle says, all your power is in the now. That is so true because um, what you want to try to manage is the now. How am I feeling now? If you are in a really crappy situation right now, right, and you are living in fear, what you don't understand on a quantum level is that is a state of constriction. What you don't understand on a vibrational uh, level is that the universe is lining everybody up two by two, vibration by vibration. The universe is not trying to hurt anybody. Nobody is more important than someone else to the universe. It's just a bunch of codes. It's just a bunch of patterns, right? It's just a bunch of waves, right? And it's just a bunch of energy lining up with like energy. So if I am fear-based, if I am fear-based, I am going to attract people who are fear-based. And that could be somebody who just robbed a bank and he's afraid of going to jail. He's afraid, right? I could be afraid that I'm not good enough and my ex-husband's going to, you know, come after me and I'm minding my own business in 7-Eleven and I bump into somebody who just robbed a bank and I'm attracted to him and I don't know. It's because he's on a fear vibration and so am I, right? On the, in the world of Caesar or, or in the world of physicality, we'll tend to judge, well, she's a good person and he was a bad person. Suspend judgment. No judgment. No judgment. Look at yourself and look at other people as a, as a vibrational being. And you will be able to heal that much quicker. That much quicker. If, because judgment is constricting you, right? And self-righteousness is constricting you. The way to be happy is through non-judgment. Judge no one. Not even yourself, right? Discern. Lion, tiger, and bear. Oh, my you know, to me, I teach my children to discern. I want them to know that there are people in this world that can hurt them, right? 
you know, I live in Long Island. Today I'm, I'm reading the news. I got so, well, I heard the news. I got so pissed off because two guys tried just to abduct two eight-year-old girls in their front yard with a gate. So these two guys, you know, drive up to this gate. They see these two little girls outside and they try to abduct these two innocent little girls. Thank God they screamed and they yelled, you know, but that's the truth, dear ones. There are people in this world that are dark. Dark energy exists. It's just a reality. So for us to go out into the world and think that everybody's like us is naive. For us to go out, I remember thinking, I just assumed that everybody thought like I did. What a kick in the ass that was when I realized, no, not everybody thinks like you. Not everybody is honest. Not everybody lets the cashier know that she gave you an extra 20 bucks and gives the money back. Not everybody will work for you and not try to hurt you. Not everybody thinks like you, Lisa. Not everybody would never think about cheating on their spouse or flirting with another person because they're in a relationship. Not everybody thinks like you. That was like such really a kick to my face when I realized that there are people that can hurt you. And so I don't let that reality um, get me stuck. What I do is I just say namaste, namaste. There are lions, there are tigers and bears, and there are narcissists and sociopaths and psychopaths, and there are people out on this planet that are below the veil and are so, so below the veil and so dark that if given the opportunity, misery loves company, they will take me with them. They will take me down with them. And so my job is to pay attention and... Um, what I do is I say namaste and I, I do what I can to like send them love and light, but I'm not inviting them to dinner and they're certainly not going to be in my bed. Hello. So, and that's not judgment. That is, that is, we are called to protect ourselves. We are called to love ourselves. We are called to set boundaries with other people. That is healthy. You have not been created to be abused by other people. You have not been created for that dear one. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. You are here to enjoy the abundance that is on planet Earth, right? Before you die. Because we're all we're all temporary. We are all transient, right? We are all going to leave this physical body behind and transition. In the meantime, we're supposed to enjoy waterfalls and butterflies. We're supposed to fall in love with the planet. We're supposed to fall in love with the self. We're supposed to teach ourselves that we are enough. We're supposed to resonate at a very, very high vibration so that we can help send these vibrations out into the world and really, really help the world. We are not called to think in black and white. We are not called to draw lines in the sand. We're not. We are called to love ourselves and then stand in not judgment of ourselves and non-judgment of others so that we can stay at a high frequency and help people who are in the dark shift just by us sending our love to them. You know, um, TT just said, Lisa, do you think we should all try and create something artful? Um, I think that creativity is a uh, source. Um, I think that creativity is love. Um, I think creativity is visceral. Creativity is the language of the soul and the language of the spirit. That could be in dancing. That could be in literal painting and artwork. Um, that could be in singing. That could be in poetry. Um, that could be in writing. That could be giving speeches. My daughter's here. Um, you know, I do think that um, it's important that we find our way of our expressing ourselves. Um, Ashley just said, where did you find the courage to share your voice and the story this publicly online? Um, oh, some, uh, Amy just said, I practiced Tai Chi this, this morning in Aspen because of you, Lisa. Namaste. I'm so happy for you. Self-care, dear one. So I'm going to answer Ashley's question and then we'll, um, and then we'll go. Um, then I'll go. And then this will be on my YouTube channel and you can watch it anytime you'd like. I think that's the way it works. Anyway. So, um, so Ashley, to answer that question, 
I always felt like an alien. I remember seven year, being seven years old and I looked up at the sky and I was like, where is my spaceship? Because these people, I don't, I don't jive with them. I did not feel like I fit in with my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, anybody. I didn't feel like I fit into school. I literally felt like I was plopped on planet Earth and like, where is my real mother? Like, where is she? Because like, this doesn't feel right. Um, all my life, I felt like I had something to say, but I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that was. And I had some pretty, pretty poignant experiences at 12 years old. I wanted to kill myself. Um, and then when I was about 13 or 14, I'm in high school and I'm like, just chilling, right? I'm like, I'm not lying to anybody again. I'm just going to be myself. And I suddenly become like, I just tell myself, I'm never, ever, 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 ever <clears throat> going to try to be something that I'm not right. Because I almost killed myself at 12 after lying to a bunch of kids and, and a bunch of shit went down. Um, and all of a sudden there's this girl who starts to take a liking to me and she starts dressing like me. You know, she starts trying to act like me. She's always wanting to hang out with me. And it was weird because I was always on the outside and suddenly all I did was say, I'm not going to try to be anybody else but myself. And all of a sudden I have this girl, young girl who like is trying to hang out with me all the time. And what happened was I had a, I was, I had a boyfriend and he was a roller rink guard back in the day we roller skated and I, I was a disco roller skating queen. Yes, I was. And I love roller skating, but I digress. And she took a picture of us skating backwards and she, um, took a black Sharpie marker and she crossed out my face and she told everybody at school that that was her boyfriend. And one of my friends found, saw the picture, told me about it and stole the picture out of her wallet and came to me. And she, my friend, um, Kathy said to me, aren't you pissed off? And I said, no. And she said, what do you mean? No. I said, I am not angry at her. And my friend Kathy was like, but she, look what she did. She took a picture of you and Albert, that was his name. And she put a Sharpie marker on his face. And she's telling everybody that that was her. You should be pissed. I said, I can't. I'm not mad at her. Because I understood what I went through a couple of years before. I was so insecure. I was so down and out as a little girl. And I lied about everything because I wanted people to love me. I wanted people to like me and I didn't feel like I was good enough. I was just trying to make be what I thought people wanted me to be. And I saw that in this girl, right? So what I did was I had, I'll never forget, I had two periods free and I just wrote her like a three or four page letter. And I said, I understand, you know, I, I've done this and I've done that and I'm so sorry you feel this way. And trust me, my life isn't perfect and you are good enough. I mean, at 13, 14 years old, I was telling this girl who basically stole my, my whole life, basically, and was pre pretending to be me, which was so weird. And all I did was offer her compassion and empathy because I knew what that felt like. So even at that young age, I was like trying to tell people that you're good enough and you don't have to be pretend to be anything that you are. Unfortunately, or for what happened was she, I put the letter in her locker and we had homeroom and I came in and she threw her arms around me and she was hysterical crying. And I thought I have a friend for life, but <clears throat> unfortunately I don't think she could handle it. I think she had a breakthrough. I think she learned something that experience and then she ended up getting a bunch of other friends, but I was happy that I didn't judge people the way a lot of the girls that I was hanging out with judged me. And that really felt profound. So the reason I share this is because um, I've had moments like that in my life where I felt like that was pretty significant and I would love to have shared that with somebody. After my divorce and I realized that, oh my God, it wasn't me. I was just programmed to be codependent. Like when I realized that my mother was a codependent and my grandmother was a codependent and I realized that I came from a long line of alcoholics when I realized that this was all a pattern of behavior and a pattern of beliefs, and I looked at my three babies, I said, oh, my God, like, 
my grandmother programmed my mother to think this way and my mother programmed me and my brother, my sister to think this way. And oh my God, I'm programming my children to think this way. You know, I was like, I got to get the hell out of here. And I committed myself to healing. At that point, my family wanted nothing to do with me, really. They thought I was batshit crazy. Um, but to be honest and completely transparent, Ashley, to me, it was just news that I could not keep to myself because I looked around and I thought, people don't know that they're asleep. Somebody's got to tell, tell them, wake up, dear one. It's all been a dream. You are enough. I just felt like somebody has to tell people, like they don't have to be codependent. It's a program. It's just a program. And you can reprogram. Like there's a way, I did it and you could do it too. And then I wrote my book and I thought, okay, I'll just write my book and um, that'll be it. And then I write my book. Um, well, before that, back that up. I wrote my book. It took me very many, a lot of years to write it. And then one night, one night, I got a phone call from my brother, and he said, um, "John just, John's dead." And I said, "What?" And he said, "John killed himself." That was my sister's husband. And I hit the floor. I just hit the floor. I hit the floor, and it was like a rocket went off in my head. And I knew you have to publish the road back to me. And by the way, if you guys want a free copy, you can actually go to audible.com and you can download a free copy of The Road Back to Me or any one of my books through audible.com. Take advantage of it. Get it for free. You can also send it to a friend for free, which I think is pretty freaking cool if you sign up for their free trial. Anyway, I digress. But when I heard that my brother-in-law killed himself, a rocket went off in my head and I knew this story, the road back to me, and the message in it is bigger than me and bigger than my family. And if I write this book and they never talk to me again, it's okay. Because what I felt, what changed my life, I knew could change someone else's life. And it could actually save their life. And I, so many people have written me and said, the road back to me changed my life. It saved my life. Your program saved my life. Or... Your meditations have changed my life. It's not me. It's the message in it, and it's the way I deliver it, which I think is unique. But I just felt that I could not keep this to myself. And so, Ashley, to answer your question, I was I was no longer afraid of what these my parents are um, below the veil, right? And so um, I just want to see something, dear one. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I just want to see if I could do something. Um, okay. I think I um, deleted a message, unnecessary message in the chat box. But um, sometimes we're, we'll have these moments in our life where we realize that something that we're experiencing is bigger than our fear. And that's what happened happened to me the night that I heard my brother-in-law committed suicide because in my humble opinion, he was severely co codependent on my sister. In my opinion, and he had actually said it himself, his parents were um, had issues with alcohol. Um, and so I knew that he was the adult child or could have been the adult child of an alcoholic. So he had been programmed like I had been programmed. And in my heart, I felt if he knew this, if he knew that it wasn't his fault, that he was afraid to live his life, that he was afraid to be himself, if he knew that it wasn't his fault that he didn't feel good enough, if he knew, if he knew maybe he wouldn't have killed himself and left my niece and my nephew and my sister behind, if he knew, if he knew. And, you know, I just think that that was one, I think every all of us will have a moment like that in our life, you know, where, a moment defines us forever. And the only reason I'm here chatting with all of you amazing, amazing people, and I love you all so much, you're, you're on my tribe. The only reason I'm here right now is because of moments like those. So you'll know, you'll know when there's a moment in your life and you'll feel this is it. This is my moment. This is bigger than my fears. I've got to do something. And 
I immediately wrote, you know, I immediately finished the book. I sent it. I was tired of waiting for publishers to like say, yes, I was a first time author. Nobody would even read my manuscript. So I was like, F everybody, you know, and I, I think it was between seven, six and $8,000. I don't remember exactly, but I was like, oh, well, I don't have that money, but I put it on a credit card, you know, and I just let it go. And I said, if that book helps one person, one person, it would be worth risking my parents, my sister, my brother, because they don't see me anyway. And I'm not spending the rest of my life, my breath, my body, my heart, my liver, my lungs, my eyes, my potential. I'm not spending the rest of my life trying to tr prove to people who can't see me that I'm good enough. I'm not doing that. And my whole world turned around from then. And so can yours. So can yours. So I really do hope that um, this, um, I don't know, we've got to block this person. Let me see if I can block this person because um, we're going to block this person because there's no reason for him to be doing what he's doing. Whatever, boundary, I'm enough. My Facebook, my, I'm sorry, my YouTube channel blocked him, dear ones. Yes, Nicole, I blocked that person. Hello. So boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. I've learned to use them. I've learned to love myself and know that I am capable of using them. Um, I accept when people get pissed off because I set a boundary. It's lovely. It's lovely to thank you, Bernice. I'm sorry. I was, I know you, I, it's, I, it says that you reported him three times. Well, he's actually been blocked and removed from the channel. You know, once in a while you get a troll like that. What are you going to do? I told you lions and tigers and bears exist, right? So we have to discern. We have to discern. So thank you for, um, you know, letting me um, figure that out. This is my first YouTube live stream like this. So it's done. So um, look forward to more. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to get one done tomorrow, but maybe Friday, you know. Um, dear ones, you are enough. And we're all on the same path. And the path is towards enlightenment, self-awareness, self-accountability, self-integration, Self-love, self-care, self, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough. Say that 10 times. I am enough, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough, I'm enough. Damn it, I am enough. I've always been enough. Hallelujah, I am enough. If you say that you're enough over and over and over and over and over and over and over, your brain will believe it. So hold on to yourselves, dear one. Namaste, about to the love and the light that is absolutely in you. Bye for now.